Greetings, my dear friends. The Ukraine war has changed the geopolitical landscape of the world in unprecedented ways. Two countries, Russia and China, which had their own history, are now considered the closest of all allies. China has steadfastly refused to condemn Russian actions, abstained in all words seeking to condemn Russia in the UN. They have shown support for the Russian security concerns and blamed NATO and the US for Ukraine war. China continues to receive oil and gas from Russia at discounted prices. China now gets over 60% of its energy requirements from Russia. China and Russia have taken part in numerous military exercises, joint patrols in the East China Sea adjoining Japan and have shown themselves to be brothers with no limits. The China-Russia alliance today makes perfect geopolitical sense, as both nations are probably the most heavily sanctioned nations on earth, even before the Ukraine conflict. Both are disruptive powers, seeking to change status quo. Russia is not satisfied with its position in Eastern Europe, and China is not satisfied with its position in the Indo-Pacific with Taiwan as its ultimate prize. Both are trying to break out of encirclement either by NATO and the US or by US. They complement each other's strengths and weaknesses remarkably well. So, are they really close allies and no limit partners or Below the surface, there is turmoil and distrust that is likely to boil over sooner than later. Welcome, my dear friends, to Chak Simplifies, your channel to simplify complex geopolitical issues into easily understandable bites. In this episode, we will examine the geopolitical realities of China and Russia, understand their respective compulsions, how they complement each other on surface and how this no limits partnership is likely to take shape in the not so distant future. We will however not discuss the Ukraine conflict and steer well clear of it, especially after my detailed video just a few weeks back. I have placed the link of that video in the description. Finally, we will focus on the likely impact on the new world order with emphasis on India. Let's take a look at Russia now. The geopolitical Russia, well, the study of geography shows very few access points into the Russian hinterland or the Eurasian steppes and Moscow. Russia was more secure during the Soviet Union days with NATO far away and the Warsaw Pact countries providing a buffer zone. The Baltic Sea and the Arctic Ocean in the north the Carpathian and the Caucasus Mountains in the west, the Black Sea in the south, all ensured Russia was kept away from NATO. Any Western army invasion would have to invade through the only gap available, the Polish gap, and that was managed with the help of Kaliningrad, the enclave within just next to Germany. Russia was a Black Sea power with Crimea and Sevastopol. It controlled access from the south. We did speak about the, ex the importance of the Black Sea in my previous video and the link is also there in the description below. Post the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1988, there was a tacit understanding with NATO that NATO would also be dissolved if, if Warsaw Pact was disbanded. Warsaw Pact was disbanded, but NATO was not. From a complete domination of steps, it is now threatened from the West because NATO has expanded from 12 countries to now over 30, 31 to be more accurate. And most of the new entrants are ex-Warsaw Pact and the three Baltic Republics. This brings NATO over a thousand kilometers closer to Russia. It renders the geographical security of Russia with the mountain ranges, Polish Gap 
and Kaliningrad virtually ineffective. Russia, however, did plug the gap from the south by its occupation of Abkhazia in Georgia in 2008 and the takeover of Crimea in 2014. The current invasion of Ukraine in 2022 can be looked at as a method to push the defensive line further westward and prevent NATO and US encirclement. If NATO was to enter, or sorry, if Ukraine was to enter NATO, it would set the cat among the pigeons because NATO would be able to move in into, from Crimea into Belarus and Moscow across the steppes, making them virtually impossible to defend. Therefore, Russia has a major red line, Ukraine and Georgia. The Russian hinterland will be less than four minutes missile flight time. It is the equivalent of the Bay of Pigs as far as Russia is concerned. Don't forget, Russia has had very unpleasant history of hostile European powers invading its territories from Napoleon to Hitler. No wonder it's an existential threat as far as Russia is concerned and therefore they will use every tool they have and calibrate it carefully. For the US and NATO, it exposes the Russian soft underbelly. Russia will be forever checkmated, forever vulnerable. It is an opportunity to destroy Russia's military capacity now in Ukraine, even before Russia pushes westward into Poland, but without NATO boots on ground. NATO, therefore, is willing to provide military assistance, economic aid. It is unwilling to lose and will fight till the last Ukrainian. That is the importance of Ukraine for NATO. Now let's take a look at China. China also has the same hemmed in feeling. It has Russia to the north, the island chains blocking exits into the Pacific Ocean on the west, India, Central Asian Republics, Southeast Asia blocking access to the east, sorry, to the west and the south. The imperatives for China are very clear. It has one major goal, unification with Taiwan. It has labor, capital, but very few resources and markets. It has to secure energy supplies via the South China Sea to fuel its relentless economic growth. Food and water security for a large population is a major issue. And more importantly, the window of opportunity is shrinking. Time is running out. Demography, economy, all at a disadvantage as far as China is concerned. It has one burning desire. It wants to be the number one power in the world. And it feels the US is the major obstacle standing between it and its dream. So it needs to break out. How will China break out? Well, its easiest option is towards the east into the Pacific Ocean. Therefore, the importance of the concept of the island chain and thus the importance of Taiwan and thereafter Philippines. It needs to break away from the Malacca dilemma. It is using the BRI which connects into Europe through the Central Asian Republics. It uses Gwadar and CEPC and has now striven hard to include even Afghanistan. It's trying hard to in bring in the Kra Canal in, the, in Thailand. That has also not been very successful. To be able to control everything, keep everybody on the defensive, it maintains territorial disputes, keeps potential adversaries unsettled and focused everywhere else. 12 neighbors and 20 territorial disputes with 20 countries. The East China Sea, the Senkaku Island, the aircraft identification zone over Thailand, over Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea. It claims 
on the South China Sea and the Nine Dash Line, large presence, creation of artificial islands, the fishing militia, and more importantly for India, it keeps Arunachal Pradesh and Ladakh boiling so that India focuses on the land borders and leaves the sea to itself. How has the world reacted to all of this? The world has been very, very slow in understanding China. It has masked itself very well by maintaining the peaceful rise of the dragon. The world finds it very difficult to extract itself out of the Chinese supply chain dilemma. It cannot ignore the vast Chinese markets, especially now with looming recession across Europe and the US. Taiwan is a trouble, is a problem for both the West and China. The US maintains a deliberately ambiguous, delightfully vague policy for the defense of Taiwan. Any attack on Taiwan may well cause a war with the US and of course Japan, Philippines, South Korea and other countries jumping in. Here the role of Quad, Quad Plus, AUKUS and other bilateral security pacts all aimed at containing or countering China start coming into focus. No wonder China is modernizing its navy. It's building capacity at a feverish pace fearing its energy flows would be blocked by the US and its allies. China has no option but to break out eastwards into the Pacific Ocean. Let's take a look at the complementary strengths and weaknesses as far as the Russia-China combine is concerned. Look at Russia. The Russian population is small, relatively of course. There's a large Chinese population that can provide the necessary labor that Russia needs for development. China is a capital-rich economy which can provide the necessary capital to grow and sustain despite sanctions. On the other hand, for China, the technological expertise in critical area, metallurgy, aerospace, space and high-tech is very important. China is well behind in all these areas. Russia can provide the raw materials, the resources from energy to minerals, all abundant in Russia. Geographically, very well located. All these minerals and energy are mainly in the Asian part, closer to the Chinese industrial areas and the, industrial, and the population centers well away from the population centers of, Europe, of Russia, which are centered in Europe. China can provide the necessary capital to exploit the resources of Russia. On the other hand, Russia can reduce its dependence on the Malacca Straits. Makes sense, right? Will it make sense forever? Now let's see the areas of conflict between Russia and China. There are hurt feelings going back into history. Russia and the European powers have had a long history of conflict with China. Don't forget the great game that was played over Afghanistan and China was sidelined. China has had what it calls the century of humiliation with European powers. The opium wars from 1839 to 1949. The British seized Hong Kong, Japan conquered Taiwan and Manchuria. China was made to make territorial concessions forced by unequal treaties and these concessions were progressively sought to take back. Tibet, 1959. Hong Kong, 1997. Taiwan still remains outside. Yet, the most unequal treaty was with Russia of the area called Outer Manchuria. The, 19, the, sorry, the 1860 treaty, the Qing, the Qing dynasty surrendered a landmass bigger in size than Ukraine to Russia without firing a shot. The boundary of Russia and China is along the Amur and the Usri rivers. 
way way back the soviets interpreted its bank on the chinese side as the boundary and china wanted it to be in the center with islands remaining with china in march 1969 they came close to a war over damansky it was a nearly a full scale war with nuclear overtones the border was finally ratified demarcated in 1991 ratified in 2004 yet the outer manchuria host cities like vladivostok the home base for the russian pacific fleet including its submarine nuclear submarine fleet without vladivostok russia cannot operate in the pacific china has no access to the sea of japan because that area is with russia no wonder china reiterated its claims over all these areas quoting history and the inequal treaties therefore to break out of us containment into the pacific there are new issues cropping up especially the central asian republics russia con- considers the central asian republics as its backyard these are rich in oil and gas minerals that china needs china on the other hand is carefully cultivating influence in these areas and to some extent exercising its great debt trap diplomacy the bri goes through this area azerbaijan uzbekistan turkmenistan kazakhstan already provide significant needs of china through pipelines russia is not amused at all with turkmenistan and uzbekistan as they have decided not to join the russia's eurasian economic integration which is the equivalent of the eu china needs to control its muslim insurgency in the xinjiang it established border patrols in 2012 with presence on the tajikistan of the tajik side of the wakhan corridor russia doesn't like it as tajikistan has permitted another country to establish military presence in its territory the russian zone of influence is being usurped by china that's the price russia may well be willing to pay today because its focus now is on europe china faces major water security scarcity over 15% of the world's population less than 7% of fresh water china is the most dammed nation with over 80000 dams north china plains has 400 million people plus but less and less water the yangtze ran dry in 2022 most of the water is in tibet tibet is sparsely populated india also faces water scarcity and will not let china have its way over the water resources so what does china do hey suddenly china realizes there is phenomenal fresh water just across the border in lake baikal the largest lake on earth with more fresh water than all the great lakes of the us combined it is 25% of earth's fresh water china's bought up land around the lake and built pipelines to take this water to china the local population resisted and china had to shut down this project how long will china wait and how long will russia hold out on the other hand in the outer manchuria there are just 8 million russians when you compare it with over 110 million chinese in just three chinese provinces bordering it resource rich sparsely populated just the opposite as china the russian population like i said earlier is shrinking demographic tensions are on the rise with more and more chinese wanting to get into this area for work and business russians are at the moment looking away they still look at chinese with great suspicion especially after the lake baikal incidents and don't forget 
China has been laying claim to outer Manchuria, including Vladivostok. So where are we now? The Wuhan virus changed the world in many ways. From how we lived to how we interacted with people. How digitalization was speeded up like nobody imagined. China was under the spotlight, its belligerence exposed. No longer the peaceful rise of the dragon narrative could be peddled. China was called out as a hegemonistic power with military, political, economic and technological challenges to the best. The use of debt trap, especially the BRI, have all come under scandal. The dismantling of global supply chains started. Russia at that time was being wooed by Europe. Lucrative contact, contracts for oil and gas, nuclear material. The idea was to deter Russia from going to war and engage with it economically. Russia itself was looking at China with suspicion. The denial of military technologies, Chinese moves around outer Manchuria, its keenness to get into the Arctic Ocean and become a near Arctic power, all very suspicious activities as far as Russia was concerned. <coughs> then happened the Ukraine war. China and Russia, no wonder, had already started mending relations, especially during the Putin area. The Russian annexation of Crimea and slapping of sanctions by US and the West changed this dynamic significantly. Sanctions drove Russia into the waiting arms of the Chinese. Something US and NATO must be regretting, although privately. The longer the war continues, more will be the Russian dependence on China. The sanctions have got harsher with Ukraine. Today, there are over 26,000 sanctions on Russia and Russian entities. Have these worked? No. The Russian economy has grown faster than the UK despite sanctions. Russians in the Forbes list have grown from 88 to 110 in just one year, the year 2022. European Union continues to import oil and gas, nuclear materials from Russia. Ukraine does not seem to be winning the war and Russia and NATO unity seems to be faltering. Suspicions put away. China and Russia now are claiming a no limits partnership. So what do they seek from each other? China wants Russian support in its quest for the global number one status. Russian resources, water, and maybe even access through outer Mongolia into the Pacific. A guaranteed access to energy through Russia. The ultimate prize, reunification with Taiwan and Russian support for that. Its immediate need is defense and space technology especially aero engines, metallurgy, submarines, and missile technology. For Russia, it needs to resolve its existential threat, its defense against NATO. Crimea is not negotiable. Donbass, Luhansk can become independent countries under the Russian umbrella. That is exactly what has been proposed by the Chinese peace plan. It also wants the removal of sanctions from the West and therefore it needs to be able to take Chinese support in getting all of this. China is flexing its muscles, is buying influence using the BRI and its checkbook diplomacy. Yet its economic troubles are mounting. An $8.3 trillion debt owed by the local governments in China. This debt is off the books, with local governments directly using what they call as non-government financial vehicle, financing vehicles or NGFV, and they use this for infrastructure finance. 48% of Chinese GDP 
is a black hole. For example, the government of Ginzu is in deep trouble and the central government in China refuses to bail it out. On the other hand, overseas defaults are growing. The Belt and Road Initiative is now Belt and Road of Bad Loans. $78 billion equivalent debt has failed in the last three years. It has had to be written off or renegotiated. Today, World Bank, IMF all want China to do more and forgive more debt, whether in Sri Lanka or in Pakistan. One big default somewhere and the Chinese financial bubble will burst. That can well trigger a global financial crisis. So what is China doing? It's what it does best, intimidating and weaponizing. From weaponizing balloons and sending them into US and other countries to spy, to weaponizing its space-based assets. Weaponization of Antarctica, building a fifth station there, because don't forget, the Antarctica Treaty comes up for renegotiation in 2048. More land you have, more stations you have, more say you have. It wants to enter the Arctic as a non-Arctic state. And don't forget, it is weaponizing its trade as a way to deal with errant nations. Ask Australia, New Zealand, Japan and a host of other countries, including India. On the other hand, China tries to present itself as a statesman. It wants to resolve conflicts. The Iran-Saudi peace deal brokered by China will help China fill the vacuum in the Persian Gulf, especially after the US has decided to scale down its presence. It is trying to broker an Israel-Palestine conflict. It now wants to play peacemaker in Ukraine also. Yet, the Chinese defense minister goes to Russia to show the strings that are attached as far as partnership with Russia is concerned. They want defense technology and the Russian delegation that met this defense minister included the deputy chairman of Security Council, Medvedev, Sergei Zhogu, the defense minister, Dmitry Shuagev, the military tech coordinator, Yuri Borisov of the space agency. More than half the team was linked to the defense industry. It continues to show a blatant show of force against Taiwan with war games, amphibious landing drills, incursions into Taiwan airspace and waters, even cutting off the internet, internet to outlying islands of Taiwan. In the middle of all of this, North Korea is a wild card. It is ratcheting up tensions by its constant testing of nuclear capable missiles and firing them. I have personally no doubt that it is China that is instigating all of this behind the scenes. <coughs> the US continues to have these freedom of navigation patrols through the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea and military exercises continue in this area with ASEAN where India is participating, US, Philippines, Japan, Korea, all of them. So what are the implications for India? India surely realizes there is only one guarantor of peace, hard power. More militarily, the military hard power with an all of government approach. The Indian military has to be combat ready with, a, with an appropriate, suitable joint command structure, technologically enabled, including manufacture of chips, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, data science, innovations in fintech. A very good civil-military fusion. Talent acquisition across the board, enabling extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. The focus on self-sufficiency or Atma Nirbharta must remain and continue. Yet, India must insert itself into dependable global supply chains as a dependable partner. It has a unique opportunity 
with the presidentship of the south of the SCO, the G20, the membership of the UNSC. Undoubtedly, it will showcase its powers, especially in the technology domain, digital space, fintech, and demonstrate it, especially for the global south. Effectively, speak softly and carry a big stick. The world is just coming out of the Wuhan crisis. China and Russia were forced to join hands despite growing economic disparities and mutual suspicion. Today, Russia is more desperate. China can and is forcing concessions. As of now, China and Russia have managed to compartmentalize their differences. But for how long? Will this lead to the to Russians becoming a junior partner to the Chinese on the world stage? What happens if Putin is removed? Or the war in Ukraine is over? Or Chinese demands are no longer acceptable to the Russians, especially over Lake Baikal, Outer Mongolia, Vladivostok, the Central Asian republics? Will China play the long waiting game that is known to do so or brace it out and initiate kinetic action in Taiwan or elsewhere against India maybe? So my dear friends, we continue living in very interesting times. If you approve the video, please do leave a like and please comment. This motivates me immensely. As always, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you have not already done so and press the bell icon to be notified of my new videos. Please feel free to share this video amongst your friends. And as always, I look forward to your suggestions and continued support. Until next time, Jai Hind.